I'm Martin Wilsey. Hey, I'm Shane McGalley. And I'm David Keener. And this is the Owlings Podcast Project. Tonight the topic is swords in fiction. And Dave's going to be leading the discussion. Dave, take it away. All right, we'll start off with the basics. I mean, what's so important about a sword, right? They're, they're sharp, pointy things. I mean, what's so special or different about them? Thoughts? I think... Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, I think that they, um, they're a symbol representing something huge, which is fantasy and other worlds. And, um, you know, even though swords cover many different eras and many different uh, styles and, uh, and countries, um, pretty much when you see a sword, that's like the, the logo of fantasy. So I just think that you got to get them right for that reason. Marty? Yeah, I, I also think that if you're going to have swords in fiction, um, you, you should know some things about swords. You know, especially if you're, um, you know, referencing uh, existing types of swords, or if you are, you can't just generically describe a sword because, trust me, there is a lot of sword nerds out there that um, will ding you if you don't know the difference between a katana and a claymore. Um, so uh, swords can be a lot of fun in good plots, both in fantasy and science fiction. Um, so, uh, I, I, uh, uh, have, have used them myself in some of the fiction that I've written and, um, I actually collect them myself. I actually have several. I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you added that part about, uh, uh using them yourself in fiction. Mm. In <laughs> I, fiction. I had this vision for a minute of Marty going down the street, uh, you know, hack, hacking and slashing away. Um, right. For myself, uh, I agree with Shay that they can be a symbol of fantasy, but I think for long portions of history, um, they meant power. They were the difference between um, you getting what you wanted and somebody else taking what you had. Um, you know, so ha the guy with the sword was the one who won. Sometimes later on, the guy with the bigger sword or the better sword or the longer sword, um, he won. Um, so what are some of the characteristics um, that can make swords different? They're not just all the same, really. Right. Um, the profile of the blade. Some, some swords are curved. Some swords are straight. Some swords have a single edge. Some have uh, double edges. And then there is size. Some are gigantic, you know, six, six or seven feet tall. Uh, some are very, very short. Um, so, uh, size, the thickness, the weight uh, can all be different in throughout history and throughout different cultures. Um, most cultures actually had swords, but, uh, they can be dramatically different. Yeah. I think in fantasy, um, I don't know why this is a trend, but it seems that the evil where you are, the more barbs your sword has. Has anyone noticed that? <laughs> the more twisty it looks. <laughs> yes, and, and from what I've seen, history does not record a lot of swords that had barbs. Um, <laughs> yeah. They had, um, there was a type of sword that are, uh, um, was a defensive sword mostly that uh, had a lot of um, grooves on the side that were specifically designed as a sword breaker. Um, hmm. Sword, sword would clash with it and would get lodged in these grooves and then they could very easily um, break poorly made swords. Um, do, you, do you think that was a common sword or was that sort of a, a specialty? I'm going to screw with specialty. you. Specialty. I, uh, I don't think it was all that common and it wasn't cross-cultural as far as I know. All right. Um, so, okay, great. We have different sizes. We have, you know, well, how heavy is the sword? Well, they can be very light, very heavy. You know, some swords that I have in my collection only weigh a few pounds. Other swords can weigh 30 pounds and are very heavy, very slow. And uh, 
and each of those have would have a different technique for wielding them and uh, would be used for a different kind of target. Okay. Um, so what are, like for instance, you've mentioned curved swords. You, we've talked about the uh, very long swords. We've talked about one-handed and two-handed swords. Um, what are some of the things that you might want to do with those? What are some of the advantages or disadvantages of those? Well, uh, some swords are designed to be able to be used with one hand. Uh, some swords are designed specifically uh, and require you to use two hands. Some swords um, can use one or two hands. Uh, that's a notable difference from, from sword to sword. Um, uh, the weight of them is very significant. Weight translates to speed. It all depends on your adversary. What's your adversary wearing? If it's just like some dude in clothes, you can have a very lightweight blade that's just super sharp and very fast and have an advantage. Um, because that sword might not work as well against somebody wearing plate armor. That's right. So if you have a, a very, very light sword, um, like a cavalry saber, that's not going to do anything against the guy in full plate steel from the you know middle ages uh so uh it, it all it all depends on who, who you're fighting against uh, cavalry swords are made to be hacking you know guys on the ground around them just wearing clothes and uh well, those, those were the curved swords as i as i recall yeah cavalry saber is a curved blade right and okay. um, my understanding was that was because it was less prone to getting stuck in the body and leaving the poor uh, uh, soldier on top of his horse without a weapon. Right. It's for slashing. Um, yeah. Curved blades work uh, less well if you're doing a thrust to uh, kill your adversary. A lot of the broadswords in medieval times were heavy, long, and tapered and pointy very pointy and maybe not that sharp, uh, specifically for piercing heavy armor. Uh, so uh, it all depends on the culture that you're in. Some, some swords were incredibly wicked sharp, you know, in the height of Japanese culture in uh, um, medieval Japan. Uh, katanas were sharper than a razor and could bisect a man diagonally easy. I think uh, one of the coolest swords are uh, gladiuses, the Roman centurion swords, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you have a sword and a sheath, you, you, your, your sheath is hanging on the opposite side, usually, of where you're going to have your sword on be, right? So you can draw it out. But um, if, you, if you recall what a, a, a centurion looks like, they have those huge uh, rectangular shields, right, that would block the, the way that they would normally pull out the sword for the sheath. So the, those soldiers were trained to take out the sword in their sword hand. Um, and they would pull, pull it out. Um, I can't demonstrate it with the camera, but they basically have to pull it out a little bit and then do a flip and have the sword in the sword arm. And I, th I thought that was a really cool um, advantage of a, of a Roman soldier, the training to be able to do that so they can still have a really bulky, huge shield. So maybe this is an interesting time to talk about like the combo of swords and shields. Well, you know? that was actually a pretty good example because uh, um, the the Roman soldier pretty much uh, fought with the relatively short um, right. gla gladius and, and, and a shield. Um, so that was fairly common. Uh, some other combinations I, I saw in my research were um, um, sword and knife combinations. Hmm. Right, sword and knife is uh, um, is wicked because you have to uh, defend and attack. And if you have a, a knife in one hand and a sword in the other, you can attack and defend at the same time. And you can actually use, you know, uh, you, the dagger that you're holding or uh, Japanese culture uh, used to at the same time often. The short, like a... A katana, you know, 
I don't, can't remember how to pronounce it, Wakasashi, um, which is a very short curved sword. And uh, it makes you a much more dangerous adversary too. I can I can see that I can I can see your opponents is just to you know your sword is now out of the position but your dagger is still right there. <laughs> That's right, right. There. and uh, a really good swordsman uh, can attack with both at the same time, and it's heaps of trouble. You know, somebody that's really trained um, is a is a much much more fierce adversary than. Uh, just a, like a foot soldier that you just handed one and, you know, go kill these people and they swing them like baseball bats. I, I think sword fights are a lot more fun to write than gunfights, in my opinion. You know, the, the gunfights in Star Wars, for example, you know, come on with their bad aim and everything. But then you get to the lightsaber fights and it's just beautiful choreography. So um, I love to read and write a good sword fight scene that has great choreography, you know, knows its stuff. Um, the clang, you know, the resounding clang on clang of, of steel on steel. It's just such artistry. So I'm, I'm a fan. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I, I really like um, the use of swords in science fiction. You mm -hmm. mentioned lightsabers as, as a yeah. perfect example. Um, I've actually read a lot of science fiction that um, has swords as a uh, key component. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times it's ceremonial. A lot of times they're practical. You, you get a, a lot of stories where they say, you know, on board they're using swords and knives because, well, you can't penetrate the hull if you got a projectile weapon. So, you know, they use uh, uh, swords. Plus, I like science fiction using swords because swords are quiet. And, uh, you know, and uh, I think that culturally we have a, uh, you know, a genetic fear or respect for them as well. Nice. Well, I also think there's the, uh, again, there's the ceremonial or, or cultural aspect of them. Um, I just recently watched, I know I'm late to the party, but uh, the movie Dune, uh, where it's basically high tech. It's a high-tech future that's ancient and almost feudalistic in, in nature. Uh, and they carry swords and they potentially fight duels and things of that nature. Um, and dueling is another category of, of swordsmanship that we didn't really, haven't really talked about. Yeah. There were swords defined uh, or designed specifically for dueling that would be terrible in, in a military battle. Or a zombie apocalypse. Or a zombie apocalypse. Right, right. One of, yeah, one of that's, the that's a, a, a certain kinds of weapons, like the swords you use in fencing, for instance. Uh, those are um, specifically designed as a pointy weapon, not as a slashing weapon. Um, but other swords are designed to be more slashy than pointy, and some are both. Right. <clears throat> I also learned this piece of trivia a, a while back. Um, apparently, if you, uh, um, you know, the, the old fencing posture of back arm like this and, the, and you're, you're fighting with the sword. Apparently, that was because you were walking, at, walking home at night through the dark streets and you were carrying a little lantern with you. <laughs> right. So you held the lantern back um, so you could see. Uh, and fight whoever was coming out of the shadows to try to take your money. I have not heard that. That's very interesting. So this, that was the origin of that of that posture, which you see at fencing matches. Hmm. You you fight one handed for your life while holding your light in the other hand. <laughs> I like how swords can be um, an asset to your characterization. You know, like you have a great character, and they have like the family heirloom sword, or just like a very recognizable sword, sort of like how Lord of the Rings does it, where everybody knows Sting, you know? And that becomes part of Frodo's character. Um, or even Excalibur, like everybody knows Excalibur, it becomes almost like a character in itself that um, that's really a companion to your character. And I, I love to see that in stories. Give, the, give your swords names, people. Make them Orange recognizable. Or Glamdring, yeah. 
Stormbringer was Elric of Melda Melda yeah, Maldabone. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Once good you stuff. once you drew it, it had to it had to uh, it had to have blood or else. <laughs> um, so we haven't even talked about magic swords, but uh, we, we've been talking more like uh, uh, real swords in, in in real life for real purposes. Yeah. So in fantasy fiction, often um, the swords actually possess a higher connotation. They can be magic. They can be heirlooms to the throne. To uh, uh, you mentioned Excalibur, for instance, um, and uh, they can have their own personalities. In fact, it, that that um, uh, could actually impact the story, or it's not their own personality; it's also some of their own history. Right. It's the, the sword that the founder of our uh, of our clan used when he took the throne or, you know, what, whatever. Um, but you can sort of imbue them with a lot of meaning. Right. Add some depth to your world. Yeah, and it, and it helps with the character development of the uh, people that are in your story. And if you uh, give them, give the swords themselves more gravitas, it's fun for the reader. Yeah. And also, I think another thing we haven't talked about with the sword, um, you see it sometimes in Star Wars, uh, but when the guy comes out and starts whirling his lightsaber around and you're like, ooh, this guy is dangerous. Um, but just just imagine the six foot six barbarian with the, the, the two handed uh, sword, you know, scaring the hell out of the, the opponents while his uh, while his fellows, his fellow soldiers who are smaller and armed with shorter swords did, did the work. Um, and he distracted them basically. Or, um, or Rainy uh, Jones pulls his gun out and blasts them. Or, or he's the guy who chops off the uh, the ends of the pikes so his littler soldiers can get in amongst the pike the, the pikes, you know, stuff like that. So you can you can see some mixing and matching too could be kind of interesting. Yeah, it's not always Conan wielding the super giant sword. So I've noticed that. Uh, um, a lot of science fiction that has swords. I'm, I'm thinking of um, like uh, Burning Chrome. Have you read? Have you read that? I have. I don't remember swords in it, but it's been a yeah. The, uh, there's uh, swords in that. Um, uh, what else? Oh, I can't think off the top of my head. Um, well, it's been a trope of what they call uh, space opera. Sometimes uh, Star Wars embodies that, but also. You know, uh, imagine uh, uh, imagine a, a, a universe where uh, there was an ancient galactic civilization and it fell, and now the now some of the planets are expanding again, but they're kind of like lower tech level, taking advantage of surviving higher tech. So they've got swords. They might even be like you know Vikings or something, and uh, but they've got spaceships. You know, yeah. the mixture of low tech and high tech. Yep. Sounds like fun. I'd read that. I would read. I I have read that. <laughs> I, I didn't right. make that up out of the whole cloth. <laughs> yep. A standard uh, standard uh, science fiction trope, uh, or also you know in science fiction you're a you're a galactic agent on a uh, on a frontier world that happens to be low tech, and so you have to blend in. Just be careful that you uh, don't write Mary Sue characters with swords, because that's like the worst, you know. What are those, Mari? Tell us. You know, have you read a character with uh, a super hot scientist that's also an incredibly expert swordswoman? Haven't you read the, those stories? Um, yeah, just don't do that too much. Takes a lot of training if you're going to be an expert about anything. Unless there's a zombie apocalypse, in which case you're either you either survive or you don't. Yeah. So zombie apocalypse stories. Man, you always gotta have a sword in that. Boy, something as simple as a machete or expedited lawnmower blade, you know, anything. Um yeah. or the guy that always story. finds the real katana in that antique store. Yeah. No, he's uh, gonna live. 
I was going to say the cavalry sword in the in the local museum were being based. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And they're like, hey, this is pretty good. I, I'm keeping this. Yeah, beats a machete with duct tape on the handle. All right. Whatever works. And that's all. That's all I've got. Unless you guys have some other last uh, comments about swords. Last comments about swords. Well, all I can say is I recommend if you're actually going to uh, write science fiction or fantasy uh, based in uh, human culture, and you actually reference swords that have hi existed historically. Research the hell out of them, you know, find some, handle them, you know, so that you can actually uh, depict uh, realistic usage of them. So, uh, so you don't have, you know, because there's sword nerds out there, like there's gun nerds and horse nerds and sailboat nerds uh, out there uh, that will ding you if you get it wrong. So don't get it wrong. Yeah, I guess I'll just echo what I said earlier, which is um, have a good sword fight in your fantasy uh, or sci-fi and make the sword part of the character. Uh, make them distinguishable in their own way. Uh, I, I've had so much fun doing that in my own writing. Um, you know, different swords matching different personalities, short, long, etc. cetera. Um, so, yeah, that's all I got. Well, I will say... Uh, I've been to, or I often go to, the uh, Virginia Scottish Festival and Games, uh, which is both a sporting event for things like the caber toss and things of that nature, uh, but it's also an event where you have um, lots of people who really like um, medieval things. And so I, I know that each time I've been there, uh, there's been at least one tent dedicated to people who, who taught various forms of swordsmanship. Uh, and the thing I found out talking to the folks is they love swords, they love swordsmanship. Uh, and if you tell them you're a writer and that you have some questions and you're willing to buy them a beer or something, they will be more than happy to talk to you about the thing that they really like, which is swords and swordsmanship. Mm -hmm. um, to the point where they may even be willing to like read your, your swordsmanship, um, your, your sword battles and, and help critique them. So never never underestimate the power of a shmi. Um, if you're if you're nice to them and uh, treat them with respect, uh, they they can be very helpful. Just like any beta reader, right? I mean, if you have a, a story that has a bunch of sword fights in it, a bunch of swords, maybe you pick a beta reader that you know is, is the kind of person that Dave is describing. Yeah, and, and truthfully, it's it's a natural thing, right? We we all have the things that we're passionate about, and if somebody really wants to talk to us about our passion and they're interested in it, sure, yeah, you talk to them, especially if you you know, especially if you throw in the beer. That's right. That's right. But don't sword fight and beer. That's not a good combo. That is not a good combo. <laughs> that's what the three stooges. To. Then it could be hilarious. There you go. Yeah. All right. Back All to right, you, guys. Buddy. All right. Sounds like uh, sounds like that's a wrap. And we'll see you guys next week. Chowder. <laughs>